Um, Hillary, before we jump in and talk about the book, I thought maybe we could talk a little about how you got into this field academically and otherwise. Sure. Um, so unlike a lot of people who write about comics, I actually wasn't a particular fan of comics as a kid. Um, I, I had older sisters, 10 and 11 years older, so I, I saw some underground comics. They had copies of the fabulous furry Freak Brothers um, in our house, which I um, thought was magical because it was all about adults smoking pot in San Francisco, <laughs> and I had no idea um, what was really happening. And I, I also had an encounter with EC horror comics when I literally found a bunch of moldering comics in a trunk in the barn. <laughs> so it was um, an encounter that felt really horrifying. significant. Wow. And they were really terrifying. Those freaked me out as a kid. They sure. really freaked yeah. me out too, but in this fascinated freak out kind of way. You didn't read the funnies or anything? Um, I liked Garfield, you know, like everybody <laughs> my age did. Um, but I didn't have a, I wasn't, I didn't know that this would be what I um, would be doing with my life um, <laughs> until I read Arts Beagleman's Mouse as a graduate student getting my PhD in English. So I hadn't read Mouse before grad school. And that was in the year 2000. I remember it was my second year of my PhD program. And I wrote a, a term paper on Mouse and I haven't stopped thinking about it since and that was 18 years ago. So it was an encounter with wow. a work that rich that made me think that I wanted to devote my time to understanding how this form worked. Did you read that for school or for fun? I read it for school. I read it in a contemporary literature class. Huh. Well, that's actually a great place to start because the book starts out with, oh wait, I wanna talk about how you thought of the book first and the structure. The structure is brilliant because it manages to somehow be chronological, biological, <laughs> and thematic all at the same time. Well, uh, I'm, <laughs> glad, I'm glad you think it very works. Very <laughs> natural, which really blew my mind. <laughs> well, so um, part of the reason I was really excited to write this book is because I was excited to write about comics for a broad audience. So for people who were already fans, but also people who were curious about the form and wouldn't necessarily consider themselves fans. You know, so for any sort of um, person interested in culture, that was my um, ideal audience for this book. And so I thought I really wanted to have a structure that wasn't dull, because a lot of academic books, and I've written three of them, um, uh, can have um, chronolo chronological structures that feel sort of plotting, or, you know, I didn't want it to feel too didactic, if that makes sense. So that's um, how I hit on the idea of themes. It's really fun to read, and it really, it feels like a page turner, which is amazing for something that makes you think critically about, uh, well, it's a lot of fun. Let's look at the first image, because it, that gets at a lot of the ideas about um, what comics can do that other forms can't, as in the same way. Uh, do you want to talk about this? I would love to talk about this. Um, so one of the um, great honors um, of writing this book is um, having people contribute original artwork to the book. So um, this is a, a comics preface by the cartoonist Gary Panter, um, whose work I absolutely love and who's a sort of central figure in the book, especially in the chapter on punk. And it's called One Point of View. And um, as you can see, it's done in his sort of signature scratchy style. So he's the cartoonist who's credited with um, innovating the so-called ratty line aesthetic. So you can see that in the image and the sort of um, scratchiness of the hand. But what I think is so amazing about this piece is that um, it's addressing people who have doubts about comics as a form. So does this? Oh, it does. This is so great. Um, so I love this last panel in which um, this little figure who's our protagonist says, these horrible comics and the people they attract are in your way. You must persevere. Um, so I thought this was a really um, brilliant preface to the book, especially because I wanted to draw people in who weren't already fans, right? 
I really like the part where he says, you can see that I'm nothing, an outline indicating head, torso, and foot, and eye and scarred stubble. Do I even have an arm? <laughs> <laughs> Right, and and the quest of comics is to trick you, the reader, into believing that I, a mere nothing, a scribble, a scrap, am alive as you, which I just think is um, so so brilliant. Because yeah. when we look at these drawings, when we look at Gary's work, when we look at Art Spiegelman's mouse, those characters feel alive to us, as though yeah, they're they real people. Really, are mesmerizing in a way that's hard to put into words, but somehow you manage. Well, I also love how he wrote. Anyhow, if you are new to comics. So he's hailing the novice reader, prepare to be confused and repulsed and eventually charmed. <laughs> so with that, um, so the first theme in your book is disaster. Yes. Which you say is foundational to comics. Yes. Oh, do you want to mention why you say comics instead of graphic novels most of the time? Sure. So... Um, if you're a person like I am who um, works in this field, you would say graphic novel if you want people to know what you're talking about at a cocktail party. Um, but actually, I'm not really a fan of the term graphic novel. And you came up with graphic narrative, I think, which I like. I, I, I helped popularize <laughs> graphic narrative as a, as a substitute for graphic novel because um, my first few books on comics are specifically about comics nonfiction. And so I think the problem with graphic novel is that it's a sort of bid for prestige. It's a bid for the prestige that now attaches itself to the term novel. Although, as I point out in the book, you know, in the 18th century, novel didn't have that prestige. Um, but it's often just a misnomer when you're trying to describe work like Art Spiegelman's or trying to describe work like Joe Sacco's or, you know, Phoebe Gluckner's. So um, I don't think it's inclusive of the range of work out there. And also a lot of cartoonists don't like it just because it, it's essentially an advertising term yeah. that was popularized in the 80s. And it did a lot of good work in terms of getting comics into bookstores, in terms of getting comics into, you know, spaces that, they weren't previously, but it's not a term that people really relish. Right. So disaster. Disaster. <laughs> um, well, disaster is the foundational theme of the comics. I mean, if you think of Superman starting in 1938, you know, what's the deal with Superman? His home planet explodes <laughs> and he's shuttled off to Earth, right? I mean, it's it's all founded on these disaster Where he encounters narratives. multiple disasters. Yes, right. <laughs> so his planet explodes, and he has to deal with all the disasters in America. You know, so this is um, obviously something disaster that um, sort of helped to shape the genre of superhero comics, but also really um, helped to shape the genre of comics or the format of comics um, that I'm really interested in, you know, the so-called graphic novel. So works like Art Spiegelman's Mouse um, about the Holocaust really set the stage for the kind of um, sophisticated work that we've seen in the past 30 years. Can you talk a little bit about, you guys probably know Mouse, right? <laughs> well, just briefly then, and should we maybe look at the Mouse picture? Yes. So. Um, just an apology in advance, it's hard to have an off-the-cuff conversation and key it to images, right? So we're going to scroll through a few until we find the one that we want, which is this one, I think. So can you talk a bit about Mouse and why it was so revolutionary? Yes. So um, in my thinking, the reason that Mouse was so revolutionary isn't because it's a comics work about the Holocaust, although I think that's related. I think the reason Mouse was so revolutionary is that it showed what comics could do formally as a storytelling form in a way that no other long form work had before Mouse came out. So um, Mouse is all about experiments with time and space. And the thing that always blows my mind about Mouse, and you also see this in a work um, like Alison Bechtel's Fun Home or you know, um, any Chris Ware graphic novel, is that each page of the work is its own aesthetic unit with its own logic to be encountered. So um, for example, on, on this page, you have these you know, regular size panels and then you have this long tier-wide panel that 
collapses two different time periods. So Art Spiegelman's father, Vladek Spiegelman, is um, describing um, four girls who were um, killed in Auschwitz. And so this is a scene that takes place in the late 1970s in the Catskills. So this family is driving to the supermarket. And so you see that we're in the space of the 1970s. Here they are driving in the car. And Vladek says, and the four young girls what sneaked over the ammunitions for this, they hanged them near to my workshop. They were good friends of Anja from Sosnovitz. They hanged a long, long time, sigh. And then you actually see the legs of the four girls hanging from the trees in the 1970s with these bodies from the 1940s. So it's not as though in this panel one time is the real time. They're both real and they're inhabiting the same space. So I would say the premise of Mouse is that the past is not past, that the past invades the present. And it's not only thematized in Mouse, but we see it formally through, through comics, which is part of its incredible genius. And that's definitely what memory feels like. These things are very present, but you don't see them. You see them in your mind's eye. Right, absolutely. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about how he came to write? The, I was really moved by the stories about um, how his mother, I think, had, had taken drawings from the camps that she had survived. That people made drawings in. Yes, um, that's, um, that's such an interesting part of the background. And I, I write about this in the disaster chapter. So um, Art's mother, Anja, um, um, had several um, pamphlets that were published after the war. Um, uh, they were mostly published, this genre of pamphlet, um, in Ukrainian, Yiddish. Um, they, so they were produced by Jewish organizations post-war. And in, in many cases, what these pamphlets were showcasing is a prisoner's experience of having been interred um, in Ravensbrück, for example. So Anja came through Ravensbrück, um, and so she had a pamphlet done by a survivor of Ravensbrück about what her daily life was like in the camp. And um, she brought these pamphlets with her. Um, uh, to Sweden, where they first immigrated, and then to New York, where they um, landed permanently. And they were placed on a so-called forbidden bookshelf, um, which Art Spiegelman discovered when he was 13, the year of the um, Eichmann trial in 1961. So around the time of the Eichmann trial, he went sort of rooting around in his parents' forbidden bookshelf, and he found these hand-drawn you know, humbly printed and produced right. pamphlets um, bearing witness um, in words and images to what life was like in the camps. And this had a profound effect on the cartoonist he would become. So his first sort of encounter with these images of atrocity that represented what his parents had been through weren't photographs, as is often the case, like in the famous Susan Sontag narrative where she says her life existed in two halves, the half before she saw photographs of Auschwitz and the half after. Mm -hmm. It wasn't photography. It was right. really withdrawing that he first understood what his parents had been through. And you, there are a lot of interesting points in your book about drawing the things that can't be photographed, um, especially in disaster. Yes. I mean, just to answer that question literally, since we're talking about um, death camps, um, you know, there was some photography that took place um, in camps like Auschwitz, but not, not generally by um, prisoners unless right. it was a work position. Um, so prisoners certainly couldn't document what their daily lives were like, except in drawing. And there are amazing um, examples of people drawing and then burning work, um, drawing and then burying work, wow. um, and finding it after the war, or drawing and then destroying work and recreating it huh. in displaced persons camps right after the war. Wow. So there was a lot of um, secret drawing and secret um, art making that went on. So how did Spiegelman then become a cartoonist and, and come up with Mouse. There's a great story about the animal part of it. There's so many great stories about the animal <laughs> part of it. I don't know which one, which one you're Just referring to. Just about how he, he was asked to contribute to this oh, animal Oh, yes. Magazine. Okay. So um, 
Another cartoonist I profile in the book, Justin Green, who did an absolutely incredible comic book in 1972, which is um, the first autobiographical comic book to have been produced called Binky Brown Meets the Holy Virgin Mary, um, about um, <laughs> obsessive compulsive disorder and Catholicism and sexuality, a really amazing work. Um, he was uh, editing an anthology comic called Funny Aminals, with the M and the N reversed deliberately. So a sort of take on the funny animal genre. And the funny animal genre, as you probably know, is the genre in which animals act like humans. Right, so um, you know, Daffy familiar, Duck has yeah. um, turkey for Thanksgiving. You know this type of thing, um, or you know, has a pet dog. You know that type of thing. Um, and so, Art Spiegelman was signed up to do a piece for this anthology, edited by Justin Green in 1972. And Justin Green's own really powerful autobiographical comics work had just come out, and Art was really inspired by that. And he first tried to beg off doing the story. He said, you know, I've thought about it. I can't do it. And then Justin Green um, sent him a letter um, not letting him off the hook. And he appended um, some tabs of speed to the letter <laughs> for encouragement. Um, and Art claims that that letter is still in his files with the tabs still taped to the letter. So he didn't, he didn't take the speed, but I think he was... Um, prodded into doing the piece, and in part inspired by Justin's own work. And this is such a sort of neat thread of connection. He decided to um, do a piece about his own family's experience, um, in which he would re-signify um, an animal metaphor that had been used against the Jews in Nazi propaganda, right? Jews as vermin. Right. So there were all sorts of reasons he decided to try out the animal metaphor, but one was he was borrowing it from an already established um, propaganda scheme. Right. Um, let's look at the next slide. of. Uh... So this is another World War II image. This is Hiroshima. Yes. So... Um... And this is just incredible. This blew my mind. I certainly knew Mouse, but I did not know this. Um, and, and this is the ultimate thing that can't be photographed. It's something that you don't know is going to happen, and that is as devastating as an atomic bomb. Yeah, I think this work is in incredibly powerful. So this is the um, cartoonist Keiji Nakazawa, who was six years old um, in August 1945 when... Um, the U.S. detonated the atomic bomb over Hiroshima City, and um, and he survived, and, and members of his family didn't survive. He and his mother survived, and his father and several siblings um, died that day. And then as an adult living in Tokyo, he decided to do comics about his experience, and so he produced a 44-page comic book called Ore Wa Mita, or I Saw It, and the, the title of his book is evocative of the famous um, Francisco Goya caption in his Disasters of War series, This I Saw. So it was very um, explicitly a work of, of witness. And, and this isn't something that could be photographed, right? This is something he experienced as a child. And part of what I love so much about his work is that I think of it as sort of like offering a phenomenology of trauma mm. or something like that. He's showing us what it felt like for him, what it sounded like, um, what the sensations were from his on the ground perspective. And there are very, very, very few on the ground perspectives from people who were survivors um, of, the, you know, of the explosion. And so um, this work is really showing um, what drawing can do that other forms can't do to capture these memories. This tree is incredible. Yeah, it's this sort of surrealistic, um, sort of what you see in a moment when, when your vision is about to be totally decimated, sort of that, that fleeting image behind your eyes. And he did this around the same time as, it was the early 70s, I think? So um, Keiji Nakazawa did this work, I saw it in 1972, the same year that Art Spiegelman did his first um, Mouse story, a three-page version of Mouse in 1972. So I, I love this idea that 
from ostensibly opposite sides of the war. You have two cartoonists whose families were directly affected by the war um, in this moment trying to come to terms with it by kind of reinventing cultural norms and sort of recreating comics as a serious form for thinking about the war. And they were both showing things that were really taboo to show, and certainly in this way that's so accessible to children. And yeah. To, uh, it just, and both got huge reactions, visceral, powerful public reactions. Re of, really taboo, yeah. yeah. So um, Keiji Nakazawa, I mean, this... This became a sort of uh, cultural truth in Japan, this work. This really helped change cultures of expression. You know, he got hundreds and hundreds of letters from people saying they hadn't actually known, you know, what had happened that day, um, sort of what the, the basics were. Um, you know, this was a time when there was still a lot of shame attached to um, being a survivor of the atomic bomb, you know, being a hibakusha, you know, literally an explosion affected person. And so he really helped change the cultures of shame around that. And for Spiegelman, I mean, now Mouse is, is um, canonical, but when the three-page version came out in 1972, I mean, I, I love this story because it's so indicative of how new it was. People didn't really know how to talk about it. Mm. Um, he has this um, great anecdote, and this is in Meta Mouse, which is the book I worked on with him about Mouse. But he says that his cartoonist friends didn't know how to really talk about the content. So they just said, you know, nice mouse man. Like, you know, you, re you can really draw mice. <laughs> it's not about the mice. And then his, he showed it to his father, a survivor, and his father's survivor friends. And it was as though it wasn't visual. Hmm. They said, you know, like, yes, I also came out from this camp. Hmm. Yes, I was also there. So it was all about situating their experience in relation to um, the people in the story. But there was no acknowledgment of the fact that it was um, in comics, you know, with this figure of mice for people. Right. It was sort of like they couldn't see that part of it, and the cartoonists couldn't see the Holocaust part of it. And in drawing something so powerful and so, I mean, even in the U.S., people's parents didn't talk about, and grandparents didn't talk about the war. I mean, oh, it was a common thing to yeah. have veterans for parents and grandparents yeah. who wouldn't talk about it. So to show something and talk about it and have it be mass produced and mass accessible and loved is a, was a huge Right, and Art's parents didn't talk to him about it either. Right, right. He had to go digging. Yeah, I was yeah. thinking that forbidden shelf of books that your parents have. <laughs> it's always a foundational childhood experience, I think, <laughs> once you discover it and yeah. look within. Um, let's go back a couple to the Katrina one. Okay. Um, this is also so powerful and beautiful and sad. This is... Um, can you talk about this a little? The, the roof says we're alive. Sure. So I, um, this is a really powerful image, and this is um, in, in the chapter on disaster. So um, you know, I wanted to, to write about comics that are also about natural disaster and the social disasters that spring from natural disasters. So this is um, and from which an, are coming. Yes. <laughs> this is from an amazing um, work of comics journalism by the cartoonist Josh Neufeld um, called New Orleans. No, it's called AD New Orleans after the Deluge. And um, what's so amazing about this page is I think it just shows how the juxtapositions of comics can set up something really powerful. So there's not a lot of text on this page. We just get this sort of documentary Mm. box at the top, sort of clinical, Tuesday, August 30th. But then it sort of rhymes the text with what's on the roof, which is the names of five people, and it just says, we're alive. And so that's one kind of juxtaposition of these two little bits of text. But then you get the amazing juxtaposition of these two panels, which are the same size. So they, they rhyme with each other, and they're literally juxtaposed on the page. And on one panel here, you see people struggling through the water to get through the water. And in the next panel here, you see a person who has already ceased to struggle, who's died. And so this, to me, is an example of something that comics can convey wordlessly through form. This kind of rhyme that it sets up at the end, you know, alive, dead, alive, dead. Um, 
is something that happens through the structure of the page mm -hmm. without it being pointed out in prose. Let's go back to um, the, the here one. Yes. Which also strangely has a, a note of disaster in it. But Yes, I, this must be seeming quite grim to everybody. <laughs> we'll move There's on to the more funny fun funny images, theme. too. <laughs> uh, but this is a lot of fun, actually. This is funny, too. <laughs> it's just a room full of insults throughout the ages. Yes. Spilled wine. Yes. Sweats, dirt bag, dipshit, jerk. And then in the future, so he collapses time through in this book every page has. Right. So um, one of the reasons I'm so happy to be um, doing this event with Sarah is that she's um, written in The New Yorker about so many artists I really care about, including Richard McGuire, who um, is the creator of this incredible book here. Um, and what, what Richard McGuire does is, in here is that he offers a fixed perspective um, image of a space. And it, it, actually, this, it actually spans millions of years. So every time you flip the page, you're getting the same space, but in a different year. It's the corner of a living room. It's the corner of a living room, but he shows it literally millions of years ago <laughs> when it was Marsh, <laughs> or whatever you want to call what was millions of years ago. Primordial. Sleep. And it also goes into the future. So it's all about... Which looks grim. Which looks grim. <laughs> there's, a, there's a nuclear disaster of some sort. But it's all about linking space and time really explicitly, which comics does anyway all the time. But through a work this powerful and this experimental, I think one really gets a sense of the kind of grammar that comics has available to it. This is um, this, this one space, but then he has all these proliferating moments of time. So these are all from the 40s through the 80s. And then layered onto that, we get this moment from um, 2111 where water is just pouring in the window so it's it's a page that's about breaking as a theme broken plate broken glass you know broken relationships right because it's all about people insulting each other and then also this broken window as water pours in so i don't know of another form that could proliferate time in the way that richard mcguire's here does I'm glad there's still a house in 2111, though. I know. <laughs> that seems I know. optimistic. And 2111 isn't that far off. So. Uh, what's our next after the... I know we're not going to talk about all of the themes. Oh, we, we're not going to get into superheroes too, too much. But superheroes is another foundational part of comics. And you do a very clever job with addressing them, I think. Well, um... <laughs> I was really excited to write the chapter um, about superheroes in this book because it actually um, isn't a subject that I had written on much in the past. So I've been very interested in writing about nonfiction comics, mm. and especially nonfiction comics about disaster, as you can probably tell. Um, <laughs> but uh, having a chance to really tackle the huge subject of superheroes head on was um, a real opportunity for me. And I feel like I learned the most writing the superhero chapter. Oh, that's and I, I had sort yeah. of the most fun writing that chapter because I was learning so much stuff. And part of what I was learning is just this incredible um, surge of diversity in the types of bodies that are getting represented as superheroes these days. And in 2016, I went to Comic-Con in San Diego, and it was just hit home for me um, being at Comic-Con. You know, people were wearing T-shirts, you know, Black Heroes Matter, for example. Um, there were a lot of panels about, um, you know, different kinds of bodies showing up in superhero comics. And there were a lot of little girls of all different ethnicities dressed up as Kamala Khan. Kamala Khan is the new Ms. Marvel. This is a very... Um, uh, well, does this make sense? Well selling, hot selling title for Marvel. Um, it's popular. Um, and Ms. Marvel is now reinvented as a Pakistani American um, teenager living in New Jersey. So here she says, my name is Kamala Khan and I'm here to take out the trash. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really this um, incredibly absorbing, incredibly charming, and incredibly 
sensitive and interesting storyline about um, her grappling not only with you know fighting all sorts of villains and um, teaming up with all sorts of other superheroes, but also um, being a, a Muslim teenager in New Jersey. So I feel really excited about the state of superhero comics right now. There's a certain amount of sneaking around, not not wanting her parents to know. Oh yeah, she yeah she sneaks superhero. out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't want her dad to know. Yeah, it's reasonable. Um, and then, for, and one thing you did in the chapter is you talked about how superheroes have influenced obviously so many artists who you write about a lot, including you talk mostly about how. You use superheroes as metaphors a little bit and talk about how two artists use them kind of ironically in recent works. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I don't know if I would say ironically. No, that was um, a terrible choice of words. No, it wasn't, it wasn't a terrible <laughs> choice of words. It's something Sideways. like irony, but it's yeah. not irony. So yeah. um, a work like Chris Ware's Jimmy Corrigan is all about sort of killing <laughs> the superhero at the center. And the superhero in this case is very DC. It's very Superman. It's very very vanilla, like the most paternal, vanilla, white male kind of superhero you can get. Um, and it's about sort of mapping out fantasies of superheroes onto family structures and sort of killing the superhero as a way to work through profound disappointment about Fathers. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in a way, it's a graphic novel premised on being anti-superhero, but it takes the figure of the superhero quite seriously, actually, I think. Yeah. In order in to reject very, it profoundly very and definitively. Yes. Yeah, that image of <laughs> Superman just dying in the street. Well, we should have had this image <laughs> tonight, but there's an amazing image um, of Superman committing suicide by jumping off a building. Of course, he doesn't fly. He lands on the ground. Um, and he's just lying on the ground on a Chicago street. And at first, passersby come and stop. And then they're not even stopping. And the main character is looking out of his office window at Superman lying dead on the ground. So <laughs> it's a, he's trying to you know, hit home a message there. <laughs> but in so many other ways, superheroes are you know, traditionally about possibility and about fantasy and right. imagining power where there isn't power and realities that can't really exist. Which is which why the inspiring. superhero is such a tempting figure for a child who has fantasies about a father who will finally come and be part of his life. Um, but then the book is about, you know, closing that fantasy down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What's the next? Um, so this, we actually have a page um, also from Chris Ware here that's not from Jimmy Corrigan. <laughs> So you have a chapter about the suburbs, and I loved, this was really fascinating to me as a huge fan of uh, reading the, the funnies as a kid. I was always, and you make this great point about how people, when you think of comics, a lot of people think of the suburbs, and yeah. reading the daily comics is a very, um, it fits in nicely with suburban life just every morning sitting there at the newspaper and then reading these little boxes of stories about suburban kids, Peanuts or... Blondie you know, even, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Calvin and Hobbes. <laughs> I love that you referred to Dagwood as wealthy, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> How would you refer to him? Sandwiched focused. <laughs> oh, sandwich focused. <laughs> well, but wasn't the point that his family thought that Blondie was a gold digger? Am I misremembering? <laughs> I thought that's what the maybe, framework maybe. was. I, I just remember him. He's napping. a rich guy into sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but there there are so many great things about um, about the suburbs and the effect that comics set in the suburbs have. You know whether they're sort of subversive about showing what the suburbs hide or what right. they mean to us. And this this is really there are a lot of touching things about how where we live reflects who we think we are and you know moving from an apartment to the suburbs for a grown-up can be a kind of terrifying thing you might be feeling like you're turning into someone that you never wanted to be or something like that which is right so this is a page here. um that is all panels of the same woman who's an unnamed protagonist 
she's unnamed throughout um, the entirety of Chris Ware's book, Building Stories, which is um, the Ware book I write about in the chapter on the suburbs. And she goes to art school, and then she and her husband have a kid, and they move to the Chicago suburbs. And this book and this page, um, both, are, are about the texture of lived experience. So it's, it's about her coming to terms with not being an artist with a capital A in the way she had imagined when she was younger, but being an artist in the sense of owning her experience and being cognizant of how she shapes time in her daily life. And this is sort of really connected to the slowed down rhythm of the suburbs in Ware's work. And, and he slows time down brilliantly in building stories. So, you know, just taking a walk with her daughter is an episode with them, you know, pointing at different flowers, for example. Mm. Um, and so he really sort of gets at that lived quality of um, experiencing time. But what I love about this page is that it's another page, sort of like Richard McGuire's here, in which the time isn't linear. So we get a sense of the scale of her life, um, and it's all um, panels of her sleeping. Sometimes she's sleeping with a boyfriend. Sometimes she's sleeping with a husband. Sometimes she's sleeping alone. Sometimes she's sleeping with a cat. Um, sometimes, you know, uh, there's color. Sometimes there's not. And then the very last panel has her as a baby. So the the panel ends with her as an infant and begins with her as an adult. So again, it's sort of evoking memory and evoking the passage of time, which really isn't linear, but sort of moves in all directions. There's nothing so timeless as a bed either. It's, you know, you <laughs> yeah. put your head on the pillow and you're like, here I am again. Right. You know? <laughs> Got to do this, I guess. Right. But then the baby is sort of floating in space and wow. no bed. Um, very sweet. Which is actually feels very moving. Yeah. Yeah, sort of you're going backwards in time in a way. Uh, what's next? Oh, so then uh, the chapter about cities is really fun. The chapter about cities that comes after the chapter on the suburbs, because yeah. you have to have both. <laughs> They're both very important. <laughs> <laughs> so cities are foundational to comics for a bunch of reasons. One, superheroes are always saving cities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of... Gotham. Oh, I loved your point about how... Um, Comics in the early days in America were popularized in newspapers to appeal to kids and also to recent immigrants. Yes, um, specifically in New York, you know, in papers published by um, Hearst and Pulitzer. Um, so it was specifically to try to drive up circulation among immigrant populations. And so American Splendor here has a lot of um, strips about public space, overheard conversations, the texture of language. A lot of very close listening and funny, strange little bits of life that are just captured beautifully. Right. So um, American Splendor by Harvey Picar has this great subtitle, um, From the Streets of Cleveland. <laughs> or I think it might be From Off the Streets of Cleveland. <laughs> so um, a lot of what this comic book does, and it's really fascinating, he started publishing it himself in the 70s. Um, so the first issue comes out in 1976. It's self-published. Um, yeah, what was the story? There was some great story about how he started doing that. Well, he, well, he wasn't. He's no longer alive. He was an obsessive record collector, oh, yeah. and there's an amazing story that he did about how he decided to quit his obsessive record collecting habit and sort of pour all that energy into creating comics instead. And money. He thought and it he, might be he more lucrative. Found he was wealthy all of a sudden when he stopped obsessively buying. By it. his standards, he was wealthy, which I really like. He had and all so, this money, yeah. But because because he actually you know sold issues of his comic book. And one of the things that's really incredible about Harvey Picar, and especially given the idea that he was popularizing this idea of sort of like everyman comics and, you know, the streets being the location and everyday conversation being the location, is that he never gave up his full-time job that's as a clerk amazing. at a VA hospital and, and in Cleveland. wouldn't take promotions either. He refused promotions, <laughs> never gave up his job, you know, and, you know, 
Along the way, you know, he got picked up by major publishers. He was a frequent guest on David Letterman. Um, he had a very famous falling out with David Letterman. Um, there was a movie made about his life starring Paul Giamatti that was a fantastic film called American Splendor. And all along, Harvey was still um, working um, as a clerk at the VA hospital because um, it gave him a lot of um, material for his comics. Yeah, one of them is the next one. But this one... I, I, there are so many great terms in this book that I learned, um, and one of them was this middle, this middle panel, which is so great. So this is a guy who goes to the library, and he wants them to evaluate his poetry. Yeah. And they don't feel qualified and suggest that he <laughs> turn elsewhere. And he says, but I read this stuff in Harper's and Atlantic with them big intellectual words, and it don't mean nothing to me. And then, and then her reaction is just so great. <laughs> I feel like that constantly. <laughs> and the word I learned for it was those lines coming out of her head are emanata. Emanata. So I didn't make that up. I mean, one of the things that's so fun about um, comics is that it has this amazing lexicon attached to it, like gutters and panels and tears and frames and bleeds and emanata. <laughs> <laughs> and so Mort Walker, the cartoonist, um, came up with the term emanata. Is he Beetle Bailey? Yes. Brian Lois? Yeah. Um, and he, he published a book called The Lexicon of Kamakana. And <laughs> apparently it was meant to be somewhat tongue-in-cheek. But when I first read that book, I studied it like it was the Bible. So if it was supposed to be tongue-in-cheek, it was totally lost on me. And so I happily use a bunch of his terms, um, like emanata. <laughs> Which is just so great. <laughs> Let's look at the next one. The next one is just a marvel. There's sort of like the, that second panel. That I don't know what you would call those things. That, that's, that's like a motion lines. Take. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's like advanced. Effort. Right. It's like both direction. Yeah, double yeah. take. <laughs> um, so this is a piece that Harvey Picard did with Robert Crumb, who is his most famous collaborator. Well, um, and he's fascinating, too, because he just wrote, he didn't draw his comics. Which right, so did. he would script out the comics um, using stick figures and then collaborate with artists who would actually draw them. But he did all of the breakdowns, so he didn't just supply the script. Yeah. He just couldn't actually render, <laughs> so he needed an artist to help him with that. And it was, it was through his collaborations with Crumb that he became the most famous because Crumb was already a, a really well-established you know, counterculture icon. And in fact, there was an amazing Robert Crumb show here in 2011 that just blew my mind. It's one of the reasons I'm so excited to be at the Society of Illustrators tonight. Um, <laughs> but um, it, Crumb illustrated a lot of his work in American Splendor, um, including this, um, which is, you know, about a conversation he had with a coworker about the fact that he buys all of his clothes at thrift stores. Yeah. <laughs> And their relationship was really interesting, too. I love, the book has so much about relationships between different cartoonists and how they affect each other and help each other out and inspire each other. Yes. I mean, um, Robert Crumb was one of the reasons that Harvey Picar became a cartoonist because he was, um, you know, inspired by Crumb's comics. He saw that Crumb was successful. But before Picar himself was a cartoonist, they were just record obsessors together. So they used to just go out um, and buy records and talk about records and trade records with each other. So they had a relationship that predated Picar ever becoming a cartoonist. Um, but um, just to pick up on one of your points, one of the real pleasures of doing this book was making all of these threads of connection legible. Yeah. Because they're actually really interesting. And these, these, these people have helped each other at various stages in their career or they went to college together. So three of the people I profile in this book all went to the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. You know, Charles Burns, Mac Raining, Linda Berry, they're all college friends. Yeah. Um, so there were all these sort of neat connections to unpack, and yeah. I, I hope that part of it came through in the book. Definitely. And it's crazy to think of them, you know, publishing in a little newspaper together. And oh, yeah, like the, the, the college, you know, student <laughs> newspaper was where, you know, they published a lot of their early work. I remember discovering those little messages that Matt Groening and Linda Berry would kind of send to each other on their um, 
permission permission page or copyright page oh yeah in high school and going they know each other how is what, what's going yes. on oh um, this is so exciting so I, I have to say about Sarah another piece that she wrote um that I've really admired was related to a show that was here, here in 2015 about alternative weeklies which was and Sarah wrote this show. great piece in the New Yorker um about the show and also about um the relationship of Matt Groening and Linda Berry who are two people I profile in the book and they do this thing where they they sort of in, embed secret messages to each other in their books he often embeds secret messages to her in his calendars which still come out every year so he often puts her birth date on the calendar and she often um, puts in the copyright page of her works things like Matt G is still funk lord of USA <laughs> all sorts of things like that um, so it's it's really charming how they're always you know giving each other shout outs and it's also there's there's another level of these relationships where it's like people are giving each other freedom and permission to try things and supporting each other and inspiring each other. Absolutely. So I don't know how many people would think it moved in this direction, but Mac Raining has talked about how inspired he was by Linda Berry's work. You know, when they were when they were young, because she had this amazingly expressive style. Um, that you can now sort of recognize in some of his work. And you know, it's inspired. loose limbs, exaggerated yeah, bodies, but right. very expressive, um, you know, very dynamic black line work. Yeah. And those early kind of crazy looking Simpsons characters. Oh, yeah. Are just, I mean, they're, they have a wilder feel, like yes. more like her, her characters feel yeah. wild. And his are very tidy a lot of the time. But those. But some Early of his Simpsons life in hell terrible. ones aren't so tidy. So we're we're going through a bunch of stuff here. But like this one, <laughs> this looks a little looser than than the style that we see on The Simpsons. Yeah, but I mean, look how neat and clean. <laughs> well, very clean. N not much in the background there. <laughs> Let's go back a little. Um, Tell me where to stop. Uh, okay, go up here. All right, now, we'll, so you have this great segue from city to punk uh, yes. in the book. Yes, yes. And I think this is, might still even be the city chapter, but they, it is the they city chapter. Nicely. Yes. <laughs> so this is an image by Jaime Hernandez, who actually did the cover of my book, um, which was another one of the huge it's honors for me um, that he did this cover for my book. And, and when we were corresponding about it, he said, you know, so what do you want in the cover? And, and I said, well, you're really good at drawing women. So here we have four women on the cover, and I just love it. But um, Jaime Hernandez comes up in the city's chapter because he does really fascinating comics about the greater L.A. area and also sort of um, L.A. Um, barrios. And so he has this um, group of characters, and in this page they're, um, they're going to a Black Flag show. <laughs> this so group, this group image is just amazing. So so this is an image of of people attending, you know, a hardcore punk show um by the group Black Flag and you can see this guy is wearing a Black Flag t-shirt and giving the finger. And I love this panel because it sort of shows you what perspective can do in comics for us to have this perspective on the assembled crowd. Mm -hmm. We get to see what they're wearing, we get to see what they're doing, we get to see this big block of people. Um, There's a this lot guy, of energy. In yeah, that. a lot of yeah. energy. And then down here we have um, the main characters um, in unison singing a song by the um, punk group X-Ray Specs. And you can see that's even noted down here, X-Ray Specs. So there's a lot of um, being rooted in punk music that comes up in Jaime Hernandez's portrait of his LA. And he had a really beautiful quote about how he felt like he came alive when he discovered punk and he felt like he had been dead and then this was kind of what brought him yeah. inspired him to do comics because it was DIY and sort of like you can you can do anything yeah he has this amazing um, quote that I that I put in the book um, in an interview he did with Neil Gaiman and he said you know it blew my mind I realized that punk and comics are sort of like the same thing um, and, I, and I think they kind of are like the same thing, um, which is in part what my chapter on punk was about. So when he um, discovered that it was about, you know, making a life instead of a corporation selling you life, in both cases, it was about making your own culture 
on your own terms in both cases. You know, it led him to do this amazing work that's um, saturated with punk, but it's, you know, his own comics that he self-published with his brothers in the very beginning before they got picked up by Fantagraphics. And so, he also felt like he could put his own world into it and his own scene, which he hadn't seen before in comics. Right. And, and as a lot of people have pointed out, you know, um, there hadn't been representations of these kinds of characters. For example, um, you know, queer girl characters in the punk world in comics before Love and Rockets. So Love and Rockets um, was really important in that sense in terms of bringing certain kinds of bodies um, to comics. Women wrestlers. Women wrestlers are part of it, too. <laughs> Women auto mechanics. Women auto mechanics, yes. One of the main characters is an auto mechanic. Uh, all right, what's next? We have this image. Oh, wait, I wanted to say something about um, there. He had a great, um, he and his brothers would draw on paper bags, I think. In Jaime their, Hernandez? Yeah, when they were growing up, when they were like, and there's all these recurring images throughout the book of kids drawing on anything they can find. Yes. So that's a big <laughs> theme. I feel like that's sort of hopefully encoded in the subtitle from underground to everywhere. So you have these kids who are trying to make their own drawings, trying to make their own culture, but without a lot of resources. So, you know, I, I point to some of these examples and they're all really moving to me. So, you know, Going back a little bit, Joe Schuster, one of the um, two people who um, is responsible for Superman, growing up as a um, kid in, in Toronto, he used to scrounge for discarded rolls of wallpaper on the street so that he could draw on the backs of the wallpaper. And he describes finding wallpaper rolls as a gold mine. <laughs> um, Keiji Nakazawa, who we talked about before um, in the post-war very lean years when he was a kid growing up. He would um, search city streets for movie posters, take down, you know, unpeel the movie posters out in public and use the white backs of the movie posters to hand sew little books that he would then draw his comics on. Um, Linda Berry has a great part in her book, 100 Demons, which I talk about here, um, advocating people to draw on paper bags. And she talks about how she composes on paper bags. <laughs> and when the Hernandez, you know, brothers were little, um, they also drew on whatever materials they could find, you know. So it's this kind of theme running throughout. People who, you know, used whatever they had at hand um, to further their artwork. And, you know, people who were then recognized for their artwork, right. you know, I against like the odds. Because they were out scrounging for the backs of discarded wallpaper pieces. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's going. Uh, what is there even to say about this timeless image, <laughs> which has become so many things? So this image is timeless to me. Um, and according to the internet, it's timeless too, because there's so many mashups of it online. So this is the um, Raymond um, Pettibone image that's the cover to the Sonic Youth album called Goo which came out in 1990, which I'll point out was the year I started high school. So this had a, um, a big um, impact on me. And Raymond Pettibone, I think, stands in for something that I'm really interested in tracing in this book. And it also accords with the theme of um, from underground to everywhere. So Raymond Pettibone is now a person, um, as many people in the audience probably know, um, who has huge museum retrospectives. So he had a huge three-story retrospective here in New York City at the New Museum last spring. Um, you know, Which I was lucky enough to get shown by good old Hillary here. <laughs> really the way to do per it. Personal you, tour. Yeah. Um, you, <laughs> you know, can. so he's, a, he's an art world star. Um, but his work is often received in the context of comics. And he came to be an art world star not by going to art school. He has a BA in economics, actually. Um, but from working in the punk scene, doing flyers, doing logos, doing you know, work that would get you know, pasted up on you know, posts in Los Angeles when he was a kid. So he did all of the flyers for his older brother Greg Ginn's band, Black Flag, which was referenced in the Hernandez um, 
uh, page that we just saw, and it was through making band flyers and all these images associated with punk bands that he then started doing zines. And then he then started doing zines that were sort of more like artist books. And then he sort of broke into the art world. So it's a sort of fascinating trajectory. And to me, an image like this represents that overlap of punk and comics perfectly. Yeah. And it's one of the many things that shows how the underground becomes mainstream and infiltrates the water right. culture. Yeah. You have, um, you have his work selling for, you know, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars now. And, you know, he says, um, you know, I still make zines. I'd give my zines away to people for free. So he's still really rooted in that kind of underground practice. <laughs> yeah. What's next? <laughs> the world don't deserve this good of a magazine. <laughs> this is just so lovable. What should we say about this? <laughs> <laughs> so this is a Gary Panter image. So this is, um, you know, the same person who did the preface to the book. And this is another example, like with the Raymond Pettibone um, Sonic Youth cover of the sort of overlap of, of comics and um, punk music scenes. So Slash was a, an L.A. fanzine. Um, that, that was really influential, and, and Panter did, obviously, covers for the magazine, and he published his comic strip called Jimbo inside the magazine. And um, Jimbo became iconic, and Jimbo also was a big influence on Matt Groening, um, especially in his um, Bart Simpson character, who has the same kind of jagged hairline. And there's a great scene where Gary Panter and Matt Groening sit down and they decide, they're hanging around together in L.A. and they decide that they want to hit the mainstream and infiltrate yeah, the culture. invade pop culture. <laughs> and they were both so successful at doing that. Um, you know, I think it was Matt Groening who has this great line who said that they were living in a couple of the sadder neighborhoods in Hollywood. Um, a life in hell was because Los life Angeles in hell was a was reference hell. to living in LA. <laughs> um, and Mac Raining had a bunch of different jobs. You know, he really worked Including hard. Including one at a Kinko's or a copy shop. He or worked something. at a copy shop and he would um, publish, which is to say photocopy his comics and send them to his friends in the Northwest, like Linda Berry. But he was doing self-publishing on the sly at the copy shop. He was also um, a landscaper. It was for, a big thing in the 90s. It was a big thing, 70s, 80s, and 90s. <laughs> Sad that copy shops are dwindling these days. They're but he was a, also a yeah. chauffeur. He was a landscaper at a sewage treatment plant. He had a bunch of really bad jobs. And he worked... Um, as a clerk in a record store called Licorice Pizza um, in L.A., and he would sell his zine in the punk section of the record store. And eventually, Gary Panter saw Life in Hell, admired it, and wrote Graining a fan letter, and then the two of them became friends. And they've often described that they would um, search in their disgusting shag carpets for, for coins, <laughs> pool their coins, and then go to Astro Burger and split burgers and scheme about how to invade pop culture, which they both did with sort of like outsized success. Yeah, I was, I was excited to notice. So Gary Panter designed all the sets and the whole look of Pee Wee's Playhouse, which is so incredibly inventive. There's a great line in here about how instead of, it was a quote, I forget who said it, but it was instead of making the 20th century look like a nightmare, Pee Wee's Playhouse took the best parts of every decade and made it a kind of fun, weird paradise. Yeah. Which is so true. And there's a little puppet who's like a grouchy little jerk with big forearms <laughs> who looks like this. Yeah. I forget his name. But uh, they, they, both, they both hit it big, for sure. They both hit it big, yeah. Um, and with Gary Panter, he also did images that look really different than this one, like this one, which is um, one of the most recognizable um, emblems of the punk movement, this Screamers poster. So um, a book was published a few years ago called Punk, colon, an aesthetic, and it's a big coffee table book, and this is the cover. Hmm. So this image alone adorns the cover, and it's in a really different graphic style. So I think part of what's interesting about looking at Gary Panter's various images in the punk scene is that you can really see 
how it's a narrative choice or a stylistic choice yeah. to make something look right. ratty right. because he can make it look very clean and yeah. graphic when he wants to, like in this image. Similar hairstyles, of course. Similar hairstyle, though. <laughs> yeah, that was a thing. <laughs> Let's keep going. Ah. <laughs> well, do you want to talk about queerness a little? Because this started going in that direction. Sh sure. So, um... So this is, this is the last chapter of my book, is the chapter called Why Queer? And um, one of the things that I think is worth pointing out, because when people think of Matt Groening, um, they might not necessarily think of Life in Hell, which was his early comic strip, and they might not necessarily think of the sort of gay themes of Life in Hell. But um, Matt Groening had these characters, Akbar and Jeff, and they were maybe lovers, maybe brothers. And um, for a while, he kind of left it open. And then finally, he, he said, yes, they're lovers. And people were really upset. And he said, you know, the more people were upset, the happier I was. Because <laughs> there actually weren't that many comic strips in the 80s yeah. that had continuing gay characters. There's a great, I'm suddenly remembering, there's a great um, comic in Love is Hell where it says hetero versus homo. And it has, you know, it's one Love of and Hell classic. is his first book. Yeah, and yeah. it has arrows going in different directions, comparing and contrasting. <laughs> and there, it's like love, possibility for intimacy, possibility for fights, but you know, all this stuff. And the only thing that's different is can wear each other's clothes, societal acceptance. <laughs> <laughs> right. So he's been dealing with this, these kinds of themes for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> right. So yeah, they're here they're trying to say I love you and not entirely not quite getting there. Romance is in between here. <laughs> All right. Let's keep going. Ah. <laughs> well, we thought this would be a fun. I mean, this there's so much to say about all of this and everything in this book, but Fun Home and Alison Bechdel and the impact that it had and also the way that it was turned into this incredible musical is a really fun thing to talk about. And this is, of course, the great Ring of Keys moment. Yes. So um, There's the famous Ring of Keys. So can everybody see um, that this woman who this child character is really riveted by has um, this Ring of Keys on her belt? So one of the things, so just to back up a little bit um, for those of you who might not have read it, um, this page is from a graphic memoir called Fun Home by Alison Bechtel, which came out in um, 2006. And it's about her experience growing up as a little kid in rural Pennsylvania um, with a closeted father who ran the town's local funeral home, hence the title Fun Home, and also was an English teacher. So running the funeral home was a part-time job because the town was so small. So he was the high school English teacher and the funeral home director, and he was also a closeted gay man. And so a lot of the friction in Fun Home is between this father who's gay and closeted and this little girl who knows that she's gay too and is sort of trying to um, come to terms with this and also trying to come to terms with what she knows is something different about her father that doesn't work in the context of their nuclear family. And he likes this very ornate furniture and kind of Rococo style. Right, so they have different aesthetics. <laughs> um, so um, she says that she was utilitarian to his aesthete. She was modern to his Victorian. She was butch to his Nelly. You know, they have different aesthetics. And there's this great scene where he's making her dust this ornate mirror. And, and she says, when I grow up, I'm going to live in a house where there's nothing to dust, like a submarine. And then she says, why do you have all this stuff? And he says, because it's beautiful. Um, so they why, have this kind of friction. Why would someone make anything this hard to dust? <laughs> oh, right. Okay, so you know the line better than I do, because it's beautiful. Um, and in this scene, for those of you who haven't read the book, um, for the first time in her life, she sees a woman who looks like what she wants to look like as an adult. And it's this really 
powerful moment of identification for her. So um, she says here, but, but like a traveler in a foreign country who runs into someone from home, someone they've never spoken to but know by sight, I recognized her with a surge of joy. And so what I love about the musical adaptation of this graphic memoir is that there's a, a beautiful song sung by the the child and you know the child actress who plays the child Allison called Ring of Keys. And actually um, this was the song that was performed at the um, 2015 Tony Awards, which was when um, Fun Home won the award for best musical, right? So speaking of from underground to everywhere, I feel like you can't get more mainstream than Broadway and you can't get more mainstream than winning the best musical award on Broadway, right? So this is really a sort of interesting story about how this work became so mainstream. But what I loved about the adaptation was I felt that the people who adapted it were so smart. This is a tiny detail, right? Yeah. It's partially obscured by the diner counter yeah. that's, that's verbally unremarked upon. Right that then becomes the basis for this sort of showstopper song uh, this in the musical. This very soaring kind of song of not love, but identification. Uh, desire and, and identification. Yeah, yeah. It's also a very sort of happy song. It's sort of about the surge of joy this little kid feels. Discovering um, yourself. Right. Yeah. But to me, it also reflected backward on the graphic novel and not only made me think that the people who adapted it were so smart, but also reminded me how powerful even tiny visual details can mm. be in the space of a comics panel. That this tiny detail was so generative. It's also really interesting. I, I hadn't seen it yet when it was on the Tonys, but that song just killed me and the girl who sang it was so wonderful. Sydney Lucas, this oh amazing God. young actress. And then when I actually saw it, I was just blown away by how well it reproduced the feeling of reading a graphic novel and of reading Fun Home. And it just fits so naturally, kind of the framing and the going from one time to another. And, you know, three actresses play her at different ages. And yeah, I think they did it something. It works much better than a film would. They or, blocked the yeah. stage out almost the way a cartoonist breaks down a comics page yeah. with different chunks of time. And then the characters at dramatic moments walked from one temporality into a different temporality, which I thought was a really um, amazing effect and, and felt very dramatic yeah. and often very moving. Yeah. Like you walk back into the space of your childhood. Right. So that's something, as we've talked about, that you can do in comics because you can collapse time in a frame. And they managed to actually do that in real time and space on the stage by blocking out these different parts of the stage to represent different times. Yeah, it felt very natural and very it did. organic. Yeah. Another thing you talked about in your book that we haven't talked about is the fact that um, when you're reading comics and graphic narratives, you can control the amount of time you spend on. I, this is something I haven't read much about, but I'm fascinated by is how much time you spend actually looking at the images and the order in which you do it. And, you know, I sometimes feel like I'm just making it up as I go along because you have so much freedom. To but you just... ought to feel that way. Yeah, there, it's, it's non-directive <laughs> right. right. the way prose is. Right. Directive, or it's not as directive. Although, of course, the artist is directing your eye a lot of the time to certain things on the page and to paths to take and stuff. But you can. But they're pace often yourself. alternate paths. Right. 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 And in the chapter about war, which we do not have images from, which are also very upsetting, when you point out that you know, with something like genocide and pictures, just images of atrocity you can control how much time you spend looking at it. And yeah, I feel like that's an important difference from film. I mean, obviously, especially because so many of us today um, watch films at home, um, you know, and you can always press pause or stop, right, on your computer or on your TV. Um, you know, that, that's a possibility. But generally speaking, you know, film is a time-based medium. Mm -hmm. So a film about genocide, for example, might have images that a viewer feels are on the screen for too long. You know, it might feel confrontational. Or, or there may be images that go by quickly. too quickly yeah. and sort of um, don't seem to ask for the requisite amount of attention. Mm -hmm. And what I think is so important about 
having these kinds of really difficult images in comics is that the reader controls the pace. The reader can close the covers or the reader can pour over the details in the image um, as long as, as he or she wants. So, so to me that kind of edges into an ethical issue when we're talking about work as, as traumatic as a lot of the work in the chapter on war, for example. Um, I wanted to talk about handwriting. Did you put the Marlis one? Yes. So this is our, this is our last image. I love this so much. <laughs> and I was telling Hillary today that uh, I had this horrible strip of wallpaper in a college apartment that I lived in for a little while that was about this long and this wide. And I papered over it with Linda Berry comics <laughs> because they were exactly the right width, which... <laughs> <laughs> A much better kind of it's wallpaper. A good, a good decorating tip for anybody. But, um. Well, you can see that this is a very text-heavy strip, but it's also <laughs> done, as you can see here, in handwriting that's supposed to be the handwriting of this child. So we were just talking about the chapter on queer comics. This comic actually comes up in my chapter on girls. Because the fun thing about writing this book is that, of course, there are a lot of overlapping themes. Yeah. You know, because there's certainly queer girls and war is disaster and so forth and yeah. so on. People but I felt they cities. were discreet yeah. enough right. in terms of traditions of work and comics. Yeah. But I like how they kind of bleed into each other, too. So um, Linda Berry actually paints her comics with a brush. <laughs> That's um, amazing. And she doesn't pencil. That's also, yeah, I was astonished so that means, reading about yeah, her Yeah, she doesn't. It's just what's coming out of her brush at that moment that makes it onto the page. And I think that you can really see that kind of um, spontaneity and attention to um, spoken voice mm -hmm. in her comics because they read like kids actually speak. <laughs> but um, she's a person who's called a lot of attention to um, how intimate handwriting in comics feels, yeah. how it really draws the reader in. And maybe this comes full circle back to Mouse because I feel like that's something that's really a powerful effect of Mouse too. Mm -hmm. So Spiegelman did Mouse at a one-to-one -one ratio, which is pretty uncommon for cartoonists, meaning he drew it at the same size it was printed. A lot of cartoonists draw bigger so they can have control over the detail and then it's printed smaller. And Spiegelman wanted it to look looser. He wanted it to feel more like a manuscript or a diary because he wanted it to have that intimacy. Mm -hmm. And it does. And cartoonists who have this really evidently handwritten, um, sort of imperfect kind of hand, the way Linda Berry does, you know, make us feel like we're reading something intimate. I was, I liked uh, when you were talking about Alison Bechdel and Fun Home, she was talking about how she wasn't touched a lot as a kid and her parents were kind of yeah. not physically affectionate and that her relationship with the page was a kind of intimacy that made up for that somehow. Yeah, I find that so fascinating. Um, that was she, a way to touch her family. She said it was a way to drawing her father was a way of touching him. Um, her father, who was already dead by the time she was drawing the book. Um, so for those of you who haven't read the book, um, her father committed suicide when she was 19, which is um, part of the, the sort of plot of the book. <laughs> it's not a spoiler though because you learn that in the first chapter. This is really isn't a book about plot in, in terms of what we think of as plot. It's really a book about archives and sort of trying to go back into the archives and figure out if her coming out had anything to do with his committing suicide. So um, she felt that drawing him was a way of touching him and she said that um, to her paper is like a kind of skin and ink is like a kind of blood which is a very evocative yes. formulation. I love that. And you had a beautiful thing about Linda Berry's writing, which I feel like I'd sort of taken in somehow but hadn't really thought about consciously, which is that it's kind of ornamental and it's fun to look at, and she can sometimes call attention to the letters themselves. Like, they're, they have curly cues. Like down and, here. Yeah. And yeah, it has a kind of um, visual surface, her work, that's not always connected to the plot. There's something so exciting, especially in the digital age, about a line on paper and the, yes. the evidence of the human hand. And isn't it weird when you see your friend's handwriting sometimes now, you're like, that's what their handwriting <laughs> looks like? Because you don't see handwriting as much anymore. It's just crazy. Yeah. So there's something so viscerally 
appealing about seeing it in comics? I mean, that's one of the reasons I love comics so much is that I, I do feel like handwriting is a kind of index of the body on the page in a way that um, is really compelling. Yeah. You get a sort of sense of the subjectivity of the maker through his or her line. I think we've talked about a lot of great stuff here. <laughs> <laughs> Should you, we have a Q&A? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we have time for questions. We also didn't talk about every chapter, but <laughs> we're we gonna covered I'm happy to keep talking, but I think <laughs> questions would be more fun for you. Um, hi, Hillary. Um, <laughs> I saw you about eight months ago, and, and I thought you had told me that there was six themes in the book. Did you expand it to ten? And if so, what were the expansions? Oh, it was always ten. It was always ten. Now with extra themes. Now with extra themes. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah, it was, always, it was always ten. Ten seemed like a good number to me, um, a, a sort of logical number, not, not too many and not too few. Um, but maybe I was talking about expansion because there's also a coda, which is called Why Fans, which I don't think um, was mentioned before. So I did wind up expanding a little bit because I wanted to talk about comics fans and I wanted to talk about what it was like going to Comic-Con and the different kinds of comics fans. So it's a little bit longer than 10, I have to confess. <laughs> Um, can you talk a little bit about the movement, not just from academic writing to more public intellectual type writing, but also you seem to navigate between different worlds a lot, academia and cartoonists, and just, you know, what that's like and, and what are sort of the trickiest parts? Um, thank you so much for asking that question. Um, I can say that I have been really inspired by the form of comics itself um, because I realized at some point when I was a graduate student getting my PhD but also writing about comics and other things for publications in New York and I'm really honored that my former editor Ed Park is here tonight. Um, so he edited um, several of my pieces about comics for the Village Voice. So I realized, for example, that I could write a piece for Ed about Fun Home, which I did. I wrote a piece in 2006 about Fun Home, right when Fun Home came out. That's actually how I met Alison Bechtel, with, who, with whom I've now collaborated on several different projects. So I met her to write a piece in the Village Voice. And because her work is so interesting and so sophisticated, I realized that the kind of writing I was doing about her work in The Voice was absolutely the kind of writing I could be doing about her in my academic writing. And so I hope that makes sense as an answer. I feel like because comics is so intricate, it's so sophisticated, and yet it's so invested in being accessible, I wanted my writing about the form to try to rhyme with that or to try to mirror that. I wanted to write it about it in a way where it could be, um, you know, in literary venues like The Voice and also in academic books. So I kind of took my cue from the form itself. Yes, Larry. What about Trump cartoons? <laughs> <laughs> what about Trump cartoons? So I think, um, I think that's a really tough one. Um, and actually, I've had a lot of conversations about this with, you know, colleagues of Sarah's at The New Yorker, like Francoise Mouly, who's the art editor of The New Yorker. Um, I had a fascinating um, dinner with her in December in which we were talking about how hard it is, because she's the person who picks the cover every month, to come up with covers about Trump. Because he's already such a caricature that it, it's really, I think, throwing caricature into a space of crisis. I think there are a lot of ways to caricature Trump that are redundant and are boring because he provides so much of the frisson of caricature already. So it's like, what, what, how do you caricature the caricature? And I think The New Yorker, to sort of bring it back onto your turf, has done a really brilliant job with that. But I think it's really, really hard. One person um, who has done this amazingly, who has sort of like escaped 
the trap, I think, of um, caricaturing Trump in ways that feel redundant is Bob Sikoriak, um, the New York cartoonist who just came out with a brilliant book of Trump cartoons um, that sort of inhabit idioms from the comics. So it'll be sort of, sort of a faux um, Wonder Woman comic, for example, but with Trump in it. So he's taken an idiom that the comics already has and he's fit, he's fit Trump inside it. And I think those are actually quite effective. Um, but I'd be curious um, to know from, from people in the audience um, if people have seen effective Trump comics or cartoons, because I think it's, I think it's tough, actually. I have. You have? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't talk about New Yorker cartoons much in your book, but um, there's one, Paul Noth from The New Yorker does amazing Trump cartoons, because they're, they're all a little bit sideways, you know, they don't... Yeah, you kind of have to be it's sideways. It's not just a big grotesque Trump. It's, right. There's a great one of sheep grazing in a field, and... Um, there's a there's a billboard of a wolf and he's saying he's smiling and saying I am going to eat you, <laughs> and the sheep are like I think he's got some really good ideas. <laughs> um, <laughs> that that is good. Yeah, <laughs> that is good. And then there's another one with uh, the the founding fathers and they're all sitting around a table writing the Constitution and one of them is saying. Well, what if a horrible tyrant came along and nobody did anything because it was all kind of funny? <laughs> Ouch. Exactly. <laughs> so I rest my case. Wow. <laughs> so comics feel very nostalgic to me because it is based on the pen and paper. Um, but as someone who works at The New Yorker and also as a fan of comics, what are you looking forward to? with new digital media that comics can address, such as like YouTube videos, or I don't know, New Yorker is doing more digital comics these days as well. Well, Sarah should talk about the digital comics, and then I'll talk really briefly about web comics. Yeah, well, I don't really have that much to say about digital comics, but didn't we have one image? Didn't we have the, did we have one from Ellie Brosh? No. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. But the New Yorker is publishing a lot more work online. Yeah. But that process is, yeah, we have a daily comic that we have. Um, there is at least one new cartoon every day on the website. That's which a lot. Is a great thing. So, you know, it has a lot of timely stuff. Yeah. It's hard. Um, we used to have it in a system where the, there would be a cartoonist who would do it every day for three months or something like that. So it was always this kind of like almost athletic thing for the cartoonists. They would get up every day and they'd kind of confront the news and come up with something. And they, they knew that it was their time to do it and they would do it for, you know, several weeks and they'd be exhausted. I would talk to them. But they were all, like, keyed up, you know, and excited. Um, and then they'd be kind of let down when their time was over. But it, you can't really sustain that forever. Right. I think now they've switched it up to a kind of a less hardcore system. Right. Um, and also, I think they have a kind of thing where if somebody has a brilliant idea and we love it, we can just put it up immediately and, and they'll kind of go viral, you know, yeah. if, if they really catch on, which is fun. And speaking of going viral, just to um, pick up on your question briefly, um, I think that web comics are sort of like the new underground comics of the 60s and 70s. And so um, I write about the cartoonist Ali Brosh and her work Hyperbole and a Half, um, which um, she first, you know, self-published on her blog, um, Hyperbole and a Half. And she started doing this when she was um, a senior biology major in college with no background in art, you know, no, no particular training for this. She has explained that she started doing these comics as a way to procrastinate for a physics final. Um, it became so popular that um, one of her installments of Hyperbole and a Half Online got um, 1.5 million unique visitors in one day. And then she went on to um, collect her work um, in a book that was a bestseller. So um, to me, the kind of lack of censorship that you saw in underground comics is um, something that we see now in web comics, where a lot of work that's really weird, a lot of work that doesn't fit in with you know, received publishing categories, a lot of work that wouldn't necessarily get through editors, or you know, a lot of work that feels really urgent and direct um, is, is coming through you know, as comics on the web. So I think that's a really sort of powerful tool for disseminating work today. 
Um, I'm not sure if this question is going to come out right, but bear with me. Um, how does change fit into these specific categories? That um, sex, there is uh, you know, the coming of age and understanding that. There's queerness and coming out. There is city going to suburb, suburb coming to city. How does that, how do those, the, the moving from topic to an, one topic to another fit into your, your thoughts on um, comics? Um, well, I hope I'm understanding your question. Um, if I'm not, tell me and I'll, I'll try it <laughs> from a different angle. But for example, you mentioned the chapter on sex, um, which was one of my favorite chapters to write because it was so much about, um, sort of like Sarah was talking about, only keyed to the question of disaster, what can't be photographed. And one of the things I was really interested in writing about in the chapter on sex is drawing fantasy. Um, and the way that drawing can become a form for sort of like the unfettered um, space of the id, right? Um, you, you can draw stuff you can't necessarily photograph, right? Um, and or so, do. Or do <laughs> in your own real life. Um, so I think both of those chapters, disaster and sex, are interested in the question of um, why drawing? Why is, why is drawing a form um, that's giving shape to these, um, these images? And so they're connected even though they're on discrete topics. Does that, does that make any sense? Maybe I didn't understand your question. There is, I'm sorry, there's city, there's suburb. There is, you know, there's sex. But you know, one, the experiencing of each of these topics changes oneself or the, the, the viewer, the, the, the subject. How does the experience of each of these subjects change the, 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 the reader, the subject, and so on? How does change work through those, uh, examining these topics? How does it change the reader's experience of it? The reader's experience, one's uh, feelings about it, one, the, 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 the character as they, the, you know, you move through mouse, that the, the individual characters like are learning about their experiences or their, the, the, the parents' experiences in the, in the war. Yeah, well, I mean, hopefully I've um, structured the book so that um, insights from one chapter are helpful to the reading of a subsequent chapter. So you mentioned the chapter on the suburbs, for example. Um, there's an image that I think is a really devastating image, actually, of a sort of um, a, like a, a date night, like a sex date for you know a married couple out in the suburbs, um, and it's sort of drained of any erotic charge, and the husband is lying on his bed naked, looking at his iPad, um, and you know the wife is standing in the doorway naked, looking horrified, and um, it doesn't seem fun. So um, this is you know an explicit image, but hopefully by the time you've gotten to this image in the chapter on the suburbs, you've already read the chapter about sex. And so you've, you've already um, hopefully been sort of keyed to how comics can work with graphic content, not just to be titillating, but to um, make a point and to make us aware of ourselves as viewers and spectators. And so I was trying to make the book have a structure in which the chapters would build on each other. Well, Does that also, answer your question better? Yeah. <laughs> OK, thank you. It's interesting to see, I think I already said this, but the way that artists gave each other permission and inspiration to cover things that hadn't been, to, to illustrate sex or to illustrate women being sexual or to illustrate images of war that we hadn't seen. Or, right. And, and you can see directly, you know, you can trace how these all, everybody influenced each other and right. kept opening it up and advancing the form and the field. Right, which is why I wanted to focus at least for a good part of the sex chapter on Robert Crumb because his sort of taboo breaking was so important to people who came after him. We can do that. We can do anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Linda Berry has this great quote, which is, um, you know, she describes being very upset by seeing Robert Crumb's work as a child, but she said that Robert Crumb gave her the feeling that in comics you could draw anything. I think a lot of people felt that way. Yeah. Yeah. How are we on time? We're good on time. It's just a little bit after 8, and we have until 8.30. We can ask some more questions. We are also inviting everybody upstairs to the third floor uh, bar afterwards, if you'd like.
So maybe and, a couple more questions? Yeah, and Hillary's going to uh, sign some books. I wanted to mention, since you mentioned Bob Skoriak, uh, he and Kriota Wilbur will be doing a series of uh, workshops starting January 31st. Um, that's a Wednesday, so it's every Wednesday for four weeks on anatomy for cartoonists. So that's available on our website, just in case, since you mentioned. And he's amazing. They're both amazing. Were there any uh, comic artists you wanted to include in the book but had to cut because of space or context or anything like that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I wish I could have um, written about a lot more people. So it was, I, it was tough to, um, to limit each chapter to, to one or two and in some very rare cases three people because there's so many people doing um, important work. But I, I really wanted the book to be able to tell stories about people's lives and their careers and how they got to do the work that I'm writing about. So I had to kind of try to keep it pretty focused. Um, but there, there are a lot of people who I wish I had had a chance to write about more. So, you know, I have one image, for example, from Richard McGuire, the one we talked about from here. I would have loved to have been able to write about his work more. Um, you know, people like Adrian Tomine, I would have loved to have been able to write about his work. He had a good quote in there, though. He does. He, he has a bunch of good quotes. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there are people who came into the book, and I wish I had had the space to be able to give them the full sort of profile treatment that I give the other cartoonists. But um, my editor is here tonight. He can already attest the book came in long. So, <laughs> unfortunately. So a volume I, two. We'll <laughs> Yes. Um, do you have some thoughts about a good way to keep up with new stuff that's coming out in graphic format? And the books are sort of expensive for one thing, so I want to choose wisely. They're really expensive. Yeah. Um, you know, as a person who teaches classes on the graphic novel, I always feel so um, badly for my students when I, you know, give them the reading list and there's building stories, which cost $50. Um, but, you know, it's, it's important, I think, that um, these books are so beautiful and that they inhabit themselves as material objects yeah. so profoundly because I, I think that marks a real difference from novels today, which, which you can read it easily um, you know, on a Kindle or another device. Um, a lot of this work, you can't sort of reflow it easily um, for that kind of portable reading. You really need to encounter the book itself. But anyway, to actually answer your question, um, I don't know. Keeping up, I think it's almost impossible to keep up because there is so much work coming out. So um, this is part of why I wanted to write to write this book because um, I'm trying to showcase the cartoonists, and most of them are living, whose work I think is is the most important. Um, Libraries have good collections these days, so that can be a good cheap way to browse, keep up, and yeah. But it's so tough. There's just so much work coming out. And I did buy Building Stories and the new Chris Ware one, so I will spend the money. If good. Well, all of his books are so beautiful. Um, they're hard not to buy. <laughs> it's not so much a question as uh, just an observation. You were talking about um, how a lot of these cartoonists used uh, what went out looking for wallpaper or just any using anything to uh, to draw on and um, we were at Michelangelo um, exhibit in the Met recently and just noticing that he drew over uh, just using every scratch of paper that he could find and drew in yeah. the back and you know he, he just kept drawing over and over on his uh, his own work yeah other people um, that search for surfaces to draw on is such an interesting one. Um, the same person I mentioned who wrote on the backs of um, rolls of wallpaper or, you know, drew on the backs of rolls of wallpaper also apparently um, drew um, on the walls of his family home, Joe Schuster, one of the <laughs> creators of Superman. So um, I think that um, urgent desire to draw wherever possible <laughs> is a, a common thread in all sorts of different artists. Thank you for that comment. <laughs> well, thank you so much Thanks, for coming. Thanks, guys. <laughs>